let's look at the word. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 12, please. Luke chapter 12. Luke writes, Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Heavenly Father, thank you again, Lord, for this rather solemn but evidently very important warning and alert that we are receiving from the Lord this morning. It was, has always been your intention that these Gospels would be read publicly from your word in front of your people and uh, expounded upon it. So we want to enter into that today. Help me, Lord, assist me to do that with, with clarity, with conviction, in, in such a way that's helpful to these people. I would pray, Lord, again for your cleansing and your enabling to do that. And I would pray again, Lord, that you'd help each one of us see with great clarity what our position would, would be before our Lord and Savior, if he is our Lord and if he is our Savior. Help us, Lord, to have very good clarity on that um, because that is the most important issue in any individual will face. So Lord, we, we pray for that and we pray that for those of us who do know our situation that we would have a good grasp of this passage that we would be able to use it for, for your glory and for the evangelism that we're called to. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, another warning passage. The warning that we are reading this morning comes close on the heels of a significant confrontation with the scribes and Pharisees that we were reading about in chapter 11. The warning sermon that we're about to, we're looking through, starts in chapter 12, verse 1, and extends through to quite a ways into chapter 13. That's all one sermon. And the crowds are enormous, and just in case you think, well, my goodness, uh, how could, how could, why are we stretching out this sermon over many Sundays? What we get in the Word of God, in the Gospels, is a praise. We get the, the high points of the sermon. And uh, they would have been elaborated on at much greater length because they had decent, you know, time frames. There would be teaching sessions of three or four hours. And I've often thought maybe we should go back to that, and then there's this, you know, okay, so anyway, so we break it up into pieces, but what I want to do is make sure that at the end of the day, you know what this passage means. When you come to it, you're not going, yeah, but what, you have this in your hip pocket that you can use it for evangelism, or that you have been confronted with it, perhaps for the first time. So we, uh, so we do that. We, uh, we go through and we try and make sure we know what, what the passage means. So, in this situation with this sermon, the crowds are enormous. The term myriads, which is a direct transliteration from the Greek, is used. And myriads is a Greek word that applies to numbers above 10,000. So, myriads in the plural means that there were a whole lot of people um, in this crowd. And he's doing what has become common uh, to the behavior of our Lord as we see during particularly the latter part of the service. 
and, and, and his time on earth, his ministry on earth, and that is to be a huge crowd around, but he would begin teaching and addressing his comments to his disciples. And he would be very much um, figuring that as he's talking to the disciples, the other people are listening too, but his primary intention was to teach the ones who were demonstrably teachable. And so we do that same thing on Sunday mornings, don't we? Uh, I, I, I teach the Word of God, and, and I teach it with the assumption that I'm teaching disciples, but fully understanding that there could well be people who have a different relationship with the Lord or, or none at all. So that's a very common thing. He's primarily speaking to his disciples, but he's also anticipating that the surrounding crowds will be listening. And the passage starts out under these circumstances, which of course is introductory. He has large, exuberant crowds, and yet tremendous opposition from the religious leaders of the nation. And it can be concluded rather uh, clearly that not all in the cloud were sympathetic, in the crowd were sympathetic to what he was teaching by any means. Some in the crowd had learned the pharisaic strategy of every time there would be some astonishing miracle performed, they were quickly parroting what they'd been taught by the Pharisees to say, oh, hey, we want to see a sign, which does a few things. Number one, it detracts attention to what did you just see? And it also, in the Greek, he, he says, basically they're saying, we want to see, see a sign from heaven. We, we want it, that's, that's nothing. We want to see something of cosmic proportions, right? And so it's a way of belittling what they had just seen, directing everyone's attention from what they've what seen, they have just seen. And, and Jesus describes it as a species of unbelief, and more than that, he says, a wicked generation does that sort of thing, where in the light of what was obvious and easily graspable of the fact that God was doing things that were miraculous, that were God only, in the midst of all that, they were mocking him. And he says that's a, that's a wicked generation, but that's what's going on in the crowd. Um, they were huge crowds, as we have said. Some were merely curious, but on the main... The huge crowds were also those who resisted the idea that their religious accomplishments were ever going to justify them in the sight of a holy God. They, they resisted the idea that Jesus said, your righteousness is not enough. They very much resisted that idea. Most had just unquestionably followed the theology of the leaders that taught, taught works, righteousness, and dependence on complicated rules to gain God's approval. That's what he means by under these circumstances. And so under these circumstances, he warns them. And I mean, what an opportunity. Here it is, he's got crowds probably similar to what you'd have at Commonwealth Stadium. And they're all pressing in and trying to hear something. And you say, so... Given the, uh, the microphone and given the time to, to speak here, what's he going to say? What we find our Lord saying is, beware. Be careful. You need to be warned. And he, he gives a very warning sermon, which we're in the midst of studying. He introduces his cautions with the alert, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and then he elaborates, which is hypocrisy. That's the thing that the hypocrisy is something that can spread through the entire people that are under the hearing audience of them. Hypocrisy. And, and hypocrisy, of course, um, is the Greek word to answer behind a mask. It means they are actors. They are pretending to be something that they're nothing, that they're not. And, and that is the very uh, common in religious circumstances. There's lots of people who are engaged in religious, either just coming to church or they're engaged in all kinds of religious activities, 
But the whole goal is to be seen. To have their works being sampled by the, by the crowd. To have their works being attributed to them and, and by that gaining some approval by the people. So, he introduces the alert. Beware of hypocrisy. And he has three points for hypocrites. God will expose. God will punish. God will keep meticulous records to see that no sin is unpunished. All of these three items are the worst possible news for hypocrites. Perhaps the greatest initial fear for a hypocrite is to be publicly exposed and humiliated. No hypocrite wants their mask pulled off publicly, but here he gives a promise. And that promise will be extended, it will be fulfilled, either in this life or the next. He says, there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Anything that in your life you're not very happy with or pleased to have other people know, listen, if you, in your response to that, rather than acknowledge and repent, if your response to that is to cover, is to conceal, here's his promise, it's going to be known publicly. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. What you have whispered in the inner room, that's that inner sanctum, that safe room that was in most house, or a lot of houses. It says it will be proclaimed upon the housetops. It, it's like all of a sudden you were having this uh, conversation that you didn't want anyone else to have and your phone is on. You did a pocket dial. And the worst possible person. And it is. You, you need to know, we all need to recognize, whenever we speak, the most important, the most devastating um, person who is hearing all of that is the Lord. You know, when he's in, in the book of James, remember that passage where he said, I don't want you to be snipping at each other, I don't want you to be critical of each other. He says, do you know why? The judge is standing at the door. Here we are, we're in this conversation, we're going, you know, you get, you, have, did you see so-and-so? Yeah, you know, he comes across and he's a real, you know, religious cat, but did you know, and you give this little, little tasty morsel, and what you don't know is right behind you, standing right by the door, is the judge, who's listening to everything. And that is the situation, he's listening to every conversation, every idle word. And all the things that we think are being kept secret are going to be made public if, I say again, our response is to conceal, smother, and cover. Of course, we looked at the last time we were together. If, on the other hand, we acknowledge and we repent of it, there is something called the atonement, where God covers where our sins are separated us from us, as far as the east is from the west, where, where God says, I'm not going to allow that testimony against that person to come up before me in court ever again. And what, a, what a mercy that is. You cover your sins, it will be exposed. You come and deal with it as God would have you, and, and wonderfully, God mercifully, graciously covers sin. Okay, that was her first point. Question. Why do people who are trying to be seen to be different than they really are, who are trying to be seen much better than they are, go through the trouble? Why, why do they go through the trouble of all that? Many religious hypocrites go to enormous effort and, and great personal hardship in order to appear better than they are, to keep up the charade. Why? Or why? In the cost-benefit analysis, what is the prize 
that they are willing to do these enormous sacrifices for. The human impulse where people want to have the admiration of others and to avoid the criticism or the disdain of others in scripture has a term. And the term is they are operating in the fear of man. They're operating in the fear of man. This is very often the motivation for the unregenerate, the unconverted, to be involved in religious activities. The, the main question, I remember working in a community in the North Country where there was a, uh, a notable group of people who were part of a denomination that was very much into works righteousness, and the most common question that would be asked at the kitchen table or under any circumstances is, what would they think? What would they think? And, it, and it's all about um, how, how, how do people think of me, not what does God think of me, right? Do people think I am as holy as everyone else? Or hopefully do they think I'm ah, a little more holy than everyone else? Have people figured out the sins that I'm hiding? All of that is tied up in this thing that Scripture calls the fear of God. As a matter of fact, last Sunday as we studied the thief on the cross, it strikes a person, as we saw both of the thieves saying what they did at the beginning, why would anyone who's being nailed on a pole, and the whole purpose of that is to be put in public display, why would anyone about to be publicly tortured to death spend any effort or attention at mocking or jeering at Christ? Why would they even do that? Why would, when, what you have to do is you have to push up on horribly painful feet where the nerves are exposed and, and pull up on your hands so that you can get breath into your diaphragm. Why would you waste that on mocking Christ? What's in it for them? Why, why would they do that? Well, I would ask you, consider this possibility. Of the men putting, being put on public display for the contempt and the disdain of the crowds that day, the two thieves did not want to be thought of as the lowest. Put the crowd's attention and jeering and scorn on Jesus, not them. Make him the most hated one on the hill. Have others think worse of Jesus than them. Take, take the attention off us. Attention over there. See, bad guy over there. Why parrot the chance of the Pharisees who are no friends of them who are applauding their deaths? Why do that? And I think probably one of the best explanations are so that they are hated slightly less than Jesus. It's a species of the fear of man. And so, verse 4 and 5, he says to hypocrites, people pretending to be what they're not. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And that's precisely the light that graciously dawned in the heart of one of the thieves on the, at the crucifixion of Jesus. He finally, and you say somewhat in the dying moments of his life, figured out who he needed to fear. And who was his most important threat? Men were killing him in the most gruesome manner that they could devise. If they need anything to accelerate the dying process, they diminished the torture time, the lingering duration of hopelessness. They wanted to keep him at a certain, all of these people, at a certain level of health 
so that the dying process took longer. This was the most brutal that men knew how to do in order to kill someone. And as such, the thief understood they're no longer a looming threat. They've given it their best lick. But, the thief realized, God has not done everything he possibly could do to him. Not by a long shot. As such, he says to the thief, who was his former partner, do you not fear God? He rebukes his former partner in crime, because all of a sudden he's figured out, here's the one that we need to fear, not men. They're doing their, doing the, they're doing their best, but that's not our biggest, biggest threat. Our biggest threat now in our lives is God and what can happen because of God. His threat assessment was entirely accurate. Do you not fear God? The greatest threat to this man was God, and it slowly dawned on him by God's grace that God was appallingly near at hand. You know, it, um, I know this is going to seem counterintuitive, as a minister of the gospel, in order to keep the gospel so that it is family friendly and, and uh, where everybody feels warm about it, um, you're comfortable and you're familiar with me saying that you've had a you've got some things going on in your life you don't like and there's some bad things happen and you need some answers, but God's your friend, and and God and and God that God is totally your friend. And the sad thing is, is if you are not repentant of your sin, God is your threat. Because if you do not repent of your sin and you die in your sins and your sins aren't paid for, He can enact, and He will, He's promised to enact, a set of circumstances that far eclipse anything that man could do to you, and that's what this passage is pointing to. People who are expending great effort to pretend to be something that they are not obviously fear men, and the acceptance and the admiration of men more than they fear God, and they're thinking about His acceptance. But that's a miscalculation in threat assessment. God can do much more to us than any man can. Men can hate you and call you names, but life goes on. And you can always move away if you have to. Right? Men can get you fired or take your business away, but you can normally do something else. Your spouse might leave you, but life will go on. They can tax you, they can mock you, they can poke you, but the worst that they can do is kill the body. And once they do that, they are now beyond your grasp. Or that you are now beyond their grasp. Their problems, correct? Not everybody knows that. Not everybody has understood that. You'd say, well, this is pretty basic. <clears throat> do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Most people would say, well, you know, I get that. That's a, that's a pretty elementary concept. But I would say that not everybody has understood that. Case in point. How many of you are familiar with, and uh, you, you've studied a little bit, and you go, oh, okay, you recognize the name <clears throat> Formosus. Formosus, anybody? Nobody, nobody recognizes the name Formosus. Well, I'm hoping by the time they're done, that'll ring a bell for you. Because in the year 866, I don't know if that was a good year or not, but in 866, Formosus was elected the Cardinal Bishop of Rome. He had a 
church position. You got to know that the very fact that I just took kind of a rough public poll here and nobody knew, um, even when he was alive, for Moses was really not all that popular. Uh, he, did, he didn't have a lot of popularity. He did uh, have a few friends that were nicely bought, but he had a very few um, very powerful enemies as well. And he made some very politically polarizing moves uh, very early into his um, tenure as the Cardinal Bishop, very politically polarizing moves, and some people wanted him dead. And so being a man of great valor, he secretly ran away from his post as bishop after robbing several groups of nuns and monks in Rome. After all, he needed some travel expenses, right? And he seemed to think he needed a rather large travel expense fund by how much he secretly plundered and then he secretly fled. Well, six years later, in the year 872, he was condemned and excommunicated. A few things happened six years after that, in 878. The excommunication was withdrawn because he promised to never, ever come back to Rome, personal promise, or exercise his priestly functions ever again. Okay. Some of the people he had angered, though, died. So in 891, he was elected the new pope. Some of the friends he had brought, uh, had bought, were now back in power. But he was still not all that popular. He still had many friends. And so, six years later, in 897, he was caused to stand trial. The Damnatio Memoria, uh, Memoria, the, the Damnatio Memoria, I, I don't do Latin very good, Damnatio Memoria was applied to him and he was declared an unworthy pope. His response? Nothing. Not a word. All of his measures, then, and acts made while Pope were declared annulled. Others, confer orders that were conferred by him were declared invalid. And then his papal robes were publicly ceremonially torn from him. And still, not a flinch. And then the three fingers of his right hand that were used to bless things were cut off. Not a word. His body was then dumped into the Tiber River. These proceedings, I must tell you, had absolutely no effect on Formoso. You go, was this guy now strangely brave? No, truth was, Formoso had died seven months earlier than his, tri than his trial. The enemies of Formoso, mostly the new pope, the enemies were furious that they had not been able to punish, excommunicate, and kill Formosa before he died, that they dug up his body seven months after his death, dressed it all in papal finery, propped his decomposing body on the papal chair in what history now knows as the Cadaver Synod, or Synodus Horrenda. The new pope addressed question after question to him. He accused him of all kinds of foul deeds that he was unaccountably unable to provide an alibi for, or even give a word of defense. The new pope then declared the damnatio memoria. I said it better the fourth time. They tore off his robes, cut off his fingers, and dumped the body in the Tiber River. Well, apparently, 
Pope Stephen IV had not read this verse. After you're dead, there's not much more that men could do to you. For Moses could not be the least bit troubled by all of these sundry indignities. Seven months earlier, he had come to face to face with the God that neither man appeared to fear. And given the behavior of Formosus <clears throat> during his life, he probably had enough worries with his present realities to concern himself with the political games Pope Stevens was playing with his physical body. It's true, after they kill you, what more can they do to you? Well, Pope Stephen IV was not the, the only one who apparently didn't get this verse straight. Apparently men like, I might as well name them so that you're familiar and you're warned. How many of you have heard John Stott? Okay. Rob Bell? Both of those men uh, evidently had not carefully read or understood these verses either. Both of these men have argued for the idea of annihilation after death for unbelievers. In the case of John Stott, it was probably because he had a, a very tender heart and he says, I just can't imagine that anybody would be under that kind of penalty forever. And it does give one pause. And it does, people have said, well, it just seems completely out of proportion. We'll deal with that. For Rob Bell, it's more an issue that he probably wanted to be one of the cool kids and have the acceptance. But in any event, the idea of hell, a hell that's a place of eternal torment, eternal torment, is deemed to be so ridiculously out of proportion and tragically out of character for God that they understood him, uh, that the, uh, the character of God as they understood him, that the idea of hell as described in scripture is now to be broadly disbelieved. But there's a problem with this position. If the worst that happens to you when you die is that you're immediately annihilated, as the Jehovah's Witness understand, that you immediately go out of any existence forever, God can actually not do anything more to you than some thug in the back alley with a, with a lead pipe. In fact, the thug would have more interaction with you than God under this unbiblical system, so it would be logical to fear the thug or anyone else and everyone else other than God. If the worst that can happen to you is die, God is never any serious threat. But what does the scripture say? That's important. Verse 5. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed. And by the way, if somebody is able to kill you, it is only at the permission of God. God will not permit you to die a day or a moment before the time that has been allocated before there was such a thing as days. Okay? So, God is the ultimate one who decides whether you live or die. And, after he has killed, has authority to cast into, and here we have a Greek word, Gehenna. Gehenna. He says, yes, I tell you, fear him. After he has killed, cast you into Gehenna. So, in other words, there is something after death. And it is a very unpleasant something for the unbelievers. Most people have the idea, oh, okay, um, for believers, the moment that they die, they go to heaven. I anybody in opposition to that, no, even atheists like that idea. They're all into that. But... People who are not believers going into hell, everyone gets a little squishy on that. But Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't. In fact, he taught it very carefully. After he is killed, cast you into Gehenna. What is Gehenna? Well, 
We're going to deal with that in, in a, a great deal of uh, detail when we get into <coughs> um, chapter 16. But I'll give you the short course, if you like. Gehenna is used of, it is uh, attributed to what amounts to a temporary holding cell for people who have died in their sins, whose sins have not been paid for. It's a temporary holding cell for unbelievers. And as I say, when we get to 16, we're going to go and do a detailed study of Gehenna, the holding place of the unredeemed dead. But for now, here's some quick considerations if you want to turn to chapter 16 and, and kind of cruise over it. In this, Jesus gives the testimony of two men as to the conditions of this place called Gehenna. Two men, the rich man and Abraham, give testimony. First, the testimony of the rich man. Here's his testimony. Jesus said that the rich man described his condition as perpetual torment without even a moment of reprieve or temporary amnesty. That's the description of an eyewitness. He declared he was tormented in the flame. And even a drop of water on the tongue would be a game changer for his condition. <clears throat> and immediately, people unquestioned, <coughs> pardon me, well, what possible effect would flame have on a spirit being? Answer, a profound effect, according to the eyewitness. Well, the nature of the flame of this place is effective, profoundly effective on spirit beings waiting for their physical bodies, according to his testimony and according to the Word of God. And some people say, well, there's a whole bunch of things going on here. It, is it literal fire? Yes, it is a literal fire. What kind of fire? The kind of fire that's really tough on spirit beings. And you say, but, but hold on, there, it, there's something going on here because it calls it a place of outer darkness as well. What kind of fire is it that is something that causes outer darkness? I, without trying to sound like a, a, a smart aleck, this kind. The kind that he has organized for this occasion. And so it is possible that it is a place of outer darkness, and it is fire, and it has effect on a spirit being. And I know that because Jesus taught that. And he has a better line on it than any philosopher in on the sand, sitting on the beach in California. Well, now the testimony of Abraham. Abraham informs, or reminds the rich man, that he is now the resident of a gated community. It's a gated community that he doesn't get to go in and out of. As a matter of fact, there's no escape for anyone across this great chasm that is fixed. And someone might ask, how effective would a chasm be upon a spirit being? Answer. Devastatingly effective, according to the testimony of all. And the occupants are being held. And evidently, they're being held with conscious awareness of their life, their past, and their future, until the day of their official sentencing. And so, it isn't a situation that they go into the fire and snuff their out, because this is a holding cell. And they need to be held in the holding cell until the official day of the great white throne judgment where all of the unbelievers who have not had their sins paid for are going to stand trial and, and then receive their sentencing. So for this chap, at least at the rich young, or the rich man, uh, the holding cell has been at least 2,000 years under the conditions that he described. So the occupants are being held with conscious awareness of their life, their past, 
their future until the day of their official sentencing. So, time will be deducted, you say, from sentence for the time incarcerated served? Sure, if you like. But sadly, 2,000 years deduct deducted from eternity still leaves you with some math quiz here, some math quiz, eternity, infinity, minus 2,000 equals, most of you have that. Ah, somebody might say, but we have said that it was a temporary rather than a permanent place of confinement. What happens when this incarceration facility is decommissioned? Well, again, the scripture tells us. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> In description of what's going on here, we'll start in Revelation chapter um, 20 with verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, go back a little bit, find out, they were thrown in there a thousand years before and they still are there. They haven't passed from existence. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the nature of this place. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. At this point in time, everyone, God, and I saw the dead, the great, the small, standing before the throne. Now, watch carefully. The books were opened. First he talks about a multiplicity of books. And then another book, different type of book, opened, which is the book of life. So, what happens is, two, book, two sets of books are open. One has to do with what the person did, what they said, what they thought, what they failed to do, what they failed to say, and all of that for the entirety of their life in mind-numbing exactness. And a second set of book, which is, okay, let's figure this out. Have any of these sins been paid for in Christ? Did he die in his sins? Did he, if he died in his sins, then he needs to go to the great white throne. And the point is, any who appear before the great white throne are those who have not got their name in the book of life. And so then the second book is determining the deeds, which is to determine the complexity and the severity of the punishment while in hell. And you go, it, he makes it very clear that in hell there are differing degrees of punishment which is only logical, which is only sane for a God who is absolutely addicted to preciseness in justice. That's why he said, for example, it is going to be more tolerable for you, Capernaum, than for Sodom and Gomorrah. More tolerable, not this is going to be a party. It's going to be more tolerable for one group of people than the other. And the basis is not because they were badder folk. The basis is what light did they have access to that they nevertheless willfully disregarded and ignored? That's the issue. That's so good living folk like the ones in Capernaum who who you know weren't all of my rowdy friends that settled down, they weren't that crew. They were they were basically pretty good folk by most people's estimation. Their punishment was going to be more severe than Sodom and Gomorrah. That gives a person pause to think. It goes on. <clears throat> then I okay, where are we at here? Um, according to their deeds, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. 
Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, we have another gated community, if you will. At least we have a place where you're never going to get out of once you are in. Is there any chance that the unredeemed are going to be annihilated? No. If the purpose of the place was to immediately annihilate, it would perform its task and pass from being ever needed and logically pass from existence because it has become obsolete. And besides, God says, the smoke of their torment, verse 10, goes up day and night. Oh, actually, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 for a moment. And I'm doing this so that we understand the nature of this place. <clears throat> then another angel, verse 9, <clears throat> a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any one worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. These who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And so, it makes it very clear. <clears throat> Is God incapable of doing anything more to men or to, to somebody than what God, or, okay, let's start, let's start that again. Is God unable to do anything more to you than man can? No. God can do horrifyingly more to you than man ever can. Well, some of you might be thinking, wow, this Pastor Howard chap sure seems to talk a great deal about judgment, damnation, and hell. He probably needs a sabbatical in some place nice and chill out a bit. How it starts a sermon series. Hey, today we're going to start studying the sermon of Jesus in chapter 12. Jesus is having a nice talk to the charming rural folk of Israel. Oh, goody. What charming pastoral and chanting lesson are we going to hear from the lips of Jesus today? Some no doubt, lovely illustration of a waterfall, a sunset, or a plucky, charming birdie on a limb, perhaps. No, you chaps need to be warned that religious hypocrites will be exposed by God, judged and punished eternally by God, according to incredibly precise records kept by God. And you might be thinking, why so many dark, threatening sermons? Pastor Howard. It's my methodology. I'm dedicated to expositing the words of Scripture, which, among other things, records the sayings of Jesus. I don't permit myself to jump around and choose passages, especially the ones about sunrises and rainbows. I take the verses as they come. My methodology tends to reproduce the teachings of Jesus according to the ratio of topics Jesus taught. By teaching verse by verse, you receive the dire warnings of Jesus in the proportion and in the volume that he taught them. And a loving teacher warns. And a loving pastor is careful to warn with the same frequency as his master. If I preach a verse by verse, you get the teaching of Jesus in the volume he taught them. And Jesus was going to be responsible with the truth in such circumstances. In such circumstances where there are men who believe that they are truly good enough to win heaven on the strength of their own merit, in such circumstances as people have concluded that if they belong to the right group, have the right heritage, 
and are about as moral as their contemporaries, that they're under no eternal threat, it's important to warn people, to caution people. They need to be cautioned. God will expose, God will judge and punish, and God is keeping very detailed records. If you're here today, and you're a believer, as uncomfortable as it seems, this is part of the message you need to replicate to the unbelievers. You go, that's, that's going to be counterproductive. You can't do that. You'll scare them off, right? It's like battering a tin pan as you're walking up on a herd of deer. They're all scattered. Let me help you with something. If you are reproducing the words of Christ, even if they're words of Christ that are completely unpalatable, that sound like they're going to be a, a horrendous time to sell, there's a wonderful thing going on. If you reproduce the words of the shepherd, my sheep hear my voice. And they know me. And amazingly, they follow. What you're responsible to do is replicate the voice of the shepherd, including this stuff. Parents, including this stuff to your kids. Seriously. Oh, no, oh. Don't, don't, don't scare the children. Can I share something with you? You will never share a portion of scripture with your kids and do harm ever. Ever. Are there some portions of scripture we should pick and choose because some of them would cause harm to your children? No. Give them the whole counsel of God. So if you're here today and you're a disciple of Jesus Christ and you're called to go into all the world and teach them everything that Jesus said, this is part of the message you need to master. And you're going to need to swallow hard. And you're going to have to deal with the idea this is going to be awkward. And get right in there with awkward and teach what Jesus said. If you're here today, and you have become aware by the Spirit of God, that you are pretending to be something that you're not. You do not need a PR remake. You do not need a new, better, managed public image. <clears throat> what you do need is a savior. And you need a very specific type of savior. You need a savior who is perfect. You need a savior who didn't need to save himself first. A savior who had no sin who did not need to be spared from the wrath of God. He was somebody who, in John, says, the Father loves the Son, has an admiration, an unbounded admiration for the Son, because he's perfect. You need that kind of a Savior. You need the kind of a Savior who would be willing to die a bleeding death in your place. You need the kind of a savior that having done that, he's willing to swap. He's willing to swap your and my legal standing. He takes it and in exchange, he gives us his legal standing of perfection. He gives us a standing before God that is as righteous as God. You need that Savior. And I think you know where to find him. In 1 Peter 
chapter 2. We read. <clears throat> for you've been called for this purpose, verse 21, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might live, die to sin, <clears throat> and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. <clears throat> and it is my prayer that that is the unhypocritical claim of everyone who's under the sound of my voice. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the manifold grace of God, the multicolored grace of God, whereby those of us who do not deserve, who have sinned, and there is no hope, now have hope, because you have paid for our sins completely, and you are willing to give us your righteousness if we will acknowledge you and embrace you as our Savior and Lord and Master to the glory of God. Heavenly Father, it's my prayer that everyone who is under the sound of my voice would, would do that this day for our joy and your glory. We, we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.